Thank you, Concordia. Um, I'm speaking today on behalf of the Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs Committee. Uh, however, uh, before I move on to the committee opinion on the clauses relevant to it in the bill, I want to express this opportunity uh, to forward our sympathies to the families of those who have died, uh, not just here, um, but across these islands, and indeed across Europe, and indeed across the world. I'd like to express uh, our appreciation and gratitude to all those working in healthcare. As I said earlier, we, we owe them a huge am uh, amount, and also express our gratitude to our frontline workers, and indeed to our community sector organisations who are doing wonderful work at local level. Uh, the departmental officials briefed the committee on the clauses that are relevant to DERA uh, on the Thursday and 19th of March, and that's clauses 23 to 27, and schedule 14 regarding uh, the food supply. Officials were able to provide us with a copy of clauses um, uh, 23 to 27 at the meeting. We heard that these clauses concern the provision of information re relating to the food supply chain. These clauses provide the appropriate authority, um, either the Secretary of State or DERA, with the power to require information in connection with disruption or perceived disruption to the food supply chain. These clauses apply across Britain and here in the North. Uh, this requirement will apply to any organisation involved in the food supply chain from producer to processor and on to the retailer. And it could, for example, apply to packaging companies or to companies involved in the feed or fertiliser industries. It's meant to apply to companies and businesses that, uh, that, that can substantially affect the uh, food supply chain or who occupy a strategically important place in the food supply chain. However, it will not apply to individuals or sole trader, traders such as farmers. To be clear, there is already a voluntary agreement in place um, between the government and food retailers, and it is anticipated that the information that might be required would continue to be provided on a voluntary basis. If, it is only if that voluntary route does not work that the provisions to uh, require this information would be activated. Activation of the powers would be subject to a commencement order. That, in effect, is the only piece of secondary legislation in these DERA-related clauses and schedules. The commencement of the powers would also require the consent of the devolved authorities, but not the devolved legislators. The committee did question DERA officials about this and expressed some unease with this approach. It was recognised that as um, uh, to be expedient for the circumstances that, that we are in. And the committee appreciates that uh, this LCM isn't following the normal process for legislative scrutiny. And in normal situations, we engage in democratic scrutiny of this legislation, but this reflects the extraordinary challenges that we are facing. We're also informed that sitting underneath this would be a memorandum of understanding between the four legislatures on how this will work in practice. If it isn't needed, the committee can, of course, request briefings on the way and how and why this uh, provision and the clauses were activated. We are also informed that it would be rare circumstances when it would be envisaged that these powers would be used. In fact, the officials pointed out that if these circumstances were starting to emerge, it would likely that they would have to come to the attention of the appropriate authority. The committee asked that the types of circumstances when this could happen, and heard one example of when commercially sensitive information was at stake. Some businesses might be very reluctant to disclose that type of uh, information. In terms of sanctions, the committee heard that there could be a financial penalty of up to 1% of turnover for either the non-provision or the provision of false information. This is the level set out in the legislation dealing with the groceries, code, adjudic uh, groceries Adjudicator Code. The committee also asked that the issue on many people's minds, that of food uh, availability, supplies into supermarkets and the manner in which some people are, are hoarding food, but it was made clear that these clauses do not deal with this aspect. We also explored with officials what plans were in place to communicate the provisions and powers in the bill to the companies and businesses that would uh, be affected. We heard that since this was predominantly about the, uh, the, the national food chains uh, across Britain and here, the communication would be in the hands of DEFRA. And finally, we explored with officials the two-year sunset clause in the bill and heard that there were already amendments in the House of Commons to put, to put in six monthly reviews. Uh, that's all I want to say as my capacity as chairperson of the ERA committee. Um, I want to just add a few comments on my role as the spokesperson on behalf of Sinn Féin on agriculture and rural affairs. And I will say that I've been contacted a lot by farmers and their families in recent times who are 
hugely anxious about the implications of this virus for their health and their safety and indeed their, their futures. And I have been contacted also by agents. You know, the, the Minister will know that uh, we're approaching the 15th of May deadline, which is a critical deadline for the submission of the single application forms for single farm payments. And whilst a lot of these are carried out online, a lot of our farmers are going to agents, they're going to neighbours, they're going to friends, they're going to leave their farms to go and get these farms uh, completed online. And that requires a meeting up with our people. And, that, and farmers leave that do leave these up until the last number of weeks. So that's something which is causing a great deal of concern for farm support workers and agents. And also the fact that in areas like my own, there is very, very poor broadband uh, in those areas. So it's not even an option to complete the uh, single farm payment application form online because it does, broadband doesn't exist in many of the areas. And indeed, many of our farmers, the average age of farmers is uh, 58. And a lot of them aren't from the, the computer generation and they do, they do need assistance. So this creates uh, extra concerns. And, and I have uh, written to the dear minister to consider this as a, a force majeure situation and to look at the range of flexibilities around that 15th of May deadline uh, in terms of the single farm payment. And indeed, uh, regrettably, we're out of the EU, but that the EU requirements no longer apply uh, to that 15th of May uh, de deadline anymore. Um, so th those are challenges. Uh, and th again, this is underpinned by a recent announcement at the weekend there of the closure of, uh, of March, and that creates additional financial challenges for our farming community. So there needs to be some flexibility and imagination around the direct payments this year, because this is a force uh, majeure situation. In relation to uh, public health, um, this is a, a big issue as well. Um, it was spoken about earlier by an, a range of speakers the needs for testing, testing, testing. And this too applies to the uh, to rural areas as well. And the Minister will be well aware within his department that, uh, and from his previous role in the DARD, on the DARD committee, of the excellent work that is carried out through the TRIPSI programme and the Public Health, Health Agency in terms of the farm family health checks, where the, uh, the nurses and the set up station at March and other locations in rural areas and carry, carry out basic checks for farmers, blood pressure, cholesterol testing and all. Surely we have a model there which can be extended into rural areas to carry out COVID testing in the time ahead as part of this ramp ramping up this testing. And I do note that across the, the south there's 40 test centres and, uh, you know, and this, is, this is carrying out right across the south of Ireland. So we do ha actually have a model here. And the Minister will know as well that right throughout rural areas, there is a range of support organisations who are on the ground doing a lot of work. He will know from his previous role as President of the Young Farmers Clubs of Ulster, indeed in my own role as a GA member and in, uh, in the community sector, there are a range of organisations on the ground doing work. They've got infrastructure which can be very easily utilised at very short notice to turn into test centres to uh, carry out vital testing in isolated rural areas. So those, those options uh, are there. So just a conclusion, um, there, there are a range of issues. Yes, we, we are concerned about the, the pace that this ALCM has been brought in, but we are in extraordinary situations and I support the motion. And, um, and I just want to just finally conclude it with, with a wee message. Our frontline workers, NHS, shops, and our supply absolutely crucial. And I also want to mention very strongly as well our community sector. Our community sector playing a fantastic role at, uh, at ground level, working with vulnerable people, people who are isolated. Uh, they're unseen, they're unheard, they're volunteers. I just want to put on record our deep appreciation for the vital work that they're carrying out at this very, very critical time. Thank you. I call Patty McGlone. Thanks very much for that.